watching fall, fall. Watch you lose in control. Now I'm seeing red. Watch you rise, watch you fall. Now I'm about to break. Face the pain, no escape. Can you step to this? Face the pain, no escape. Can you step to this? Face the pain. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Fix Fights podcast with Kurt and Ben. Ben and I are lucky enough to be joined today by the founder of Tap Cancer Out, John Thomas. John, thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you guys? Doing good, man. Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty good us. over here. Um, good to hear. Yeah, man. So really quick before we get or, uh, while we get started, if you could, mm-hmm. for the listeners, just give us a quick backstory on Tap Cancer Out. Um, you know, you're doing big things in there, but, uh, for whoever doesn't know about it, if you could just give us a little backstory on tap cancer out. Sure. I mean, there's a long backstory, but I'll try to <laughs> give sort of the short, the short backstory. But, um, so tap cancer out is, uh, a jujitsu nonprofit, uh, simply put, we host charitable Brazilian jujitsu tournaments and really, um, give the jujitsu community a platform. Um, to create change and, and make an impact in the world, specifically in the fight against cancer. So um, it was a really simple idea of combining uh, my passion for jujitsu, I guess, with my hatred for cancer. And I wanted to figure out a way where um, by doing jujitsu, you could make a difference in the world and, and raise money for cancer. So I had actually... Um, you know, this model isn't new. I didn't invent it. I had actually taken part in what's called team and training for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, where um, both myself and my wife actually uh, committed to raising $1,000 each. And as long as we did that, um, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, uh, you know, bought our entry into the Hartford Half Marathon. They got us a hotel room the night before. All the runners did. Um, and, you know, a team dinner and a, a VIP tent for you to visit before and after the race. So all these, you know, what we call perks, um, just for fundraising, uh, for a great cause. So it was really fun. Um, but my biggest issue was I hate to run. Uh, and I especially don't like running 13.1 miles. So I never did it again. And, you know, that always bugged me and, you know, but jujitsu, I like doing, and I want to do it all the time. So, um, you know, was there a way to blend this idea of perks and, um, and jujitsu tournaments and something that somebody would want to do, um, at least once a year, uh, for us. So, um, I just sort of copy and pasted that idea. And, and also sort of an added benefit was, you know, with jujitsu tournaments being pretty cost prohibitive, if you're comparing it to, you know, um, paying six bucks to go, uh, play, you know, uh, get in a men's basketball league or something or pick up, you know, pick up basketball game. It's not, uh, easy to do with jujitsu. It's very expensive and you can't be doing it every single weekend. Um, if we're just talking about money. So, uh, giving people a way to, uh, make an impact, but compete for free as well. It's like this win-win that I don't know how anyone could not want to do that. Um, if they do want to compete, not everybody competes. So we have other ways for them to get involved. But, um, so that was the concept in 2012, uh, we kicked it off in Connecticut and sort of tested it and, uh, it went amazingly, which, uh, was, um, surprising considering I had never hosted a tournament. I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know who to hire. I, you know, I, I was pushing all of our American top team teammates out there on the mats to ref. They didn't even know they were refing when they got there. You know, it was like we lucked out in a lot of different ways that it went as smooth as it did. Um, and then we just wanted to get better and better every single time we hosted a tournament and add more and more cities. So we went from one to two to three to four. We just kept adding one and one until we made the big leap uh, to add a tour, which is when you go, you know, um, over a span of two months, we visit a new city every weekend. Um, and that's when we really saw this thing take off and um, giving larger and larger gifts from the first one, which is $26,000, I believe, to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, um, to our most recent gift to Alex's Lemonade Stand for um, over $870,000. So 
awesome. um, yeah, it's been a wild ride, but we just keep trying to, um, you know, get bigger and better. Man, that's, that's pretty impressive. I will say, first of all, I also hate running. I don't want to speak for Kurt, but I bet he also hates running. <laughs> I and hate Kurt, running. <laughs> we, we all for sure enjoy jujitsu more than running, but so I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, bef before, before you got on the call, Kurt and I were, were kind of discussing how like any more, um, if like, we don't like to pay to do a jujitsu tournament anymore. Yeah. Um, and you, like you talked about, you're kind of combining the best of both worlds. You're not paying, but also you're, you're giving back. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm curious, um, kind of going back to the nexus of the idea where it all started, like, why, why did you pick, we're going to, we're going to donate this money to cancer research? Well, for two reasons. One, selfishly, it's um, it's affected my life greatly. Um, most notably, after losing uh, my nephew when he was only um, eight months old, um, I believe. Yeah, he. I mean, he he was diagnosed at three months old, so he he pretty much had leukemia from the moment he was born, um, and he fought you know, all the way from March to December. And that was really the moment when, when I saw him for the last time and sort of saw what cancer did to this beautiful young baby's body. I mean, he was, he was gigantic. He looked like a four-year-old because he was pumped with so many fluids and things like that. And it didn't look anything like, you know, the baby that I had, had been used to seeing. And that's when I felt like totally helpless. And I realized like, oh, you know, all my well wishes and my visits and stuff like that was not doing anything. And I and, and I had done nothing to help this young boy. And I didn't want any families to, to feel that way. Um, I've lost other people very close to me in my family, too. But that was the one where I really started thinking about what is it that I can do? And I didn't have an answer for that for a very long time um, because it's not easy, you know, and, like so running or I guess cycling or swimming. There's the swim across the sound in, in Connecticut, but like there's not a lot of ways for people to activate uh, and get involved in a, in a cause where they can make a difference doing something fun, you know, like volunteering or uh you know any type of service it's like a punishment for people um so i i was keen on figuring out a way that we could you know get the jiu-jitsu community involved and also it was you know every tournament that i went to it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger these tournaments were getting huge it's sort of like gone in waves i i kind of don't feel like tournaments are as big as they were like when i started but um it was definitely a community the community has continued to get bigger and bigger when i first had to choose a school it was like two schools like 30 right. or 40 minutes away from me now you can't drive down the street and not see another jiu jitsu school they're everywhere now so you know even just in the time that i've been training the landscape has changed so i saw all this momentum in this you know massive white space of there really being no philanthropic presence in jiu jitsu um at all. So, you know, it, it just sort of made sense. And I would love to see it in other sports too. I, I still haven't really seen it that much. Um, there's actually one in wrestling called pin cancer, but, yep. um, but other than that, like you see, like, you know, the NFL might yeah, bring in, you know, breast cancer for a month or something, but you don't see these nonprofits that are sort of built from within the sport barbells for boobs and in, in CrossFit. That's another one. Um, they've actually, their staff has been wonderful to me in answering all my questions as I was learning how to do all this stuff. But um, yeah, it just seems to make sense. You know, it's uh, you want people to do good and it's easier to do good when you're having fun and doing something that you like. Um, so that's sort of how it all started. It is man. And, and, I mean, you do a great job. I've been to numerous of the Tap Cancer Art tournaments. I've competed in them. I competed in the Sub Only Showcase. Um, you know, I also donated my hair uh, along mm -hmm. Luscious Locks <laughs> to uh, to charity. And man, it was one of the the you know most fulfilling things I've done. Right, doing a Tap Cancer Art tournament or yeah. donating my hair. And I think it just brings you know a lot of guys don't want to compete. Right, they don't want to get out there and compete. Yeah. But I think for it's the hard. one tournament that they do. It's Tamcats are out, right? Because they know they're doing it for a good cause. They're raising money. And we have guys at the gym that 
don't even compete and they just raise the money. So, man, I, I can't say enough good things about it. I think you're doing awesome for the community, right? And like you said, I think I, – and I wish more organizations uh, would do it in, across more sports. Yeah, and, and to your point about competing too, this is one of the things that actually I guess the, the silver lining of this whole – um, it really forced us to uh, how to get people involved without getting everybody together for a tournament. And it's a nut that we've been trying to crack for years, but we didn't really have a lot of motivation to do that because our tournaments were just doing so well. And so we were just focused on growing the tournaments we have. So, uh, you know, our, our first tournament ever raised $17,000, our Connecticut tournament, now that one raises $300,000. So we're trying to drive all those tournaments in that direction. I believe every city can hit the $300,000 mark or more. Um, and then it was adding new cities. How many more tournaments can we host in a year? And so that's how we, that's all we were ever focused on. It's all we, the bandwidth that we ever had, that we only have three employees and we hired one, my wife, last, this past year. So, um, I mean, I was mostly doing this just in, you know, nights and weekends and using vacation days to rent the U-Haul and pick up all the mats and everything and drive to a location. And then I was back to work on Monday. Um, so it made sense that we just focused on the things that were driving the most revenue. But someone in Seattle or someone in Canada or someone in the U.K., they can't go to our tournaments. So what do they do if they're really passionate about Tap Cancer Out and they want to get involved? They either buy a lot of merchandise, which people do all around the world, uh, or they shell out the money to travel to tournaments, which we also see. We, we've had people drive from Oklahoma to Connecticut back when we were hosting only a couple of tournaments a year. You know, people, we see people fly from all over the place, but that's not fair. I want to get them involved. So, um, you know, the pandemic forced us to, if we have no tournaments, we did have some showcases, but if we have no tournaments, how do we get people involved? And also how do we keep the people who were fundraising? We had um, over 400 or 500 fundraisers alone and, and more competitors than that already signed up for our Connecticut tournament when we had to cancel it or yeah. postpone it and then cancel it. Um, and then we had all these other fundraisers who had started fundraising for our spring and our fall dates um, that, you know, once you cancel those, they're kind of, you know, why am I going to keep fundraising? It, it made sense. So um, we created Global Grappling Day. And the concept was pretty simple. You know, we saw a lot of nonprofits who host, you know, 5Ks and things like that. That's really easy. So instead of all of us getting on this one starting line and running the same, you know, five kilometer route, just run it in your neighborhood. You know, that's easy. Fundraise do all the same fundraising and run it in your neighborhood. You can't just like jujitsu in your own neighborhood, right? you know, like right. you need at least one other person. Right. Uh, but uh, some of our fundraisers prove that you don't even need another person. So, um, so we, it was just, you know, one hour, which is an uncomfortable amount of time to roll with. And I was inspired by our, our, I say our, cause uh, Kurt trained with me and I'm right top team, but exactly. you know, when you get your black belt, you have to roll for an hour straight with br fresh brown and black belts. And it was, the worst <laughs> jiu-jitsu experience I've ever had, but I did it. So, uh, and I didn't die. So just like rolling for an hour straight and I use parentheses cause you know, you can take some water breaks or whatever, Absolutely. but it was that concept of like, okay, roll an hour straight with one other person on this one day and we'll all do it on the same day and we'll do it from around the world. Um, and now that all the competition jitters, like all of the negatives of a, of a tournament are thrown out the window. Now it's just do jujitsu, you know? And we had people um, grapple with grappling dummies. We had people just give their significant other an hour long jujitsu lesson. And um, luckily, so Dave is, my wife is our one employee and Dave is the third employee, but we just moved down to South Carolina. And so we weren't sure when he was coming down here. So my wife was prepared to be my partner. She's never done jujitsu <laughs> ever. Wow. She was prepared. She said, we can just roll or you can give me a lesson or whatever. But I, you know, and I, and that meant a lot to me because nice. she's no interest in jujitsu, but luckily Dave moved down like the week before. So we were able to, I was able to roll with Dave for an hour. We did it outside on my in-laws who also moved down here. 
they just got a new house and so they have like a little patio on the back so we laid down our warm-up mats that we have uh, for the tournaments and we did it outside and uh had a bunch of dogs at the fence all around us watching us some random kid came and just sat and watched us a little like four-year-old girl so awesome. um so it was great but you know that was so we were forced into figuring out how to to get people involved and it absolutely blew us out of the water how many people took part you know our i think our original goal was like a hundred thousand we ended up raising two hundred seventy six thousand. awesome man we're not gonna that's been again only because a lot of those people will, will be taking part in the tournaments and not in global grappling day which is fine i just want you to take part in something um but still the the awesome thing was seeing how many people from around the world did take part. I don't even know like how they've heard of tap cancer out or, I mean, we do, we advertise and things like that, but um, we had uh, 12 different countries, people from 12 different countries take place, including I think every province in Canada and 40 U S states right at midnight Eastern uh, <laughs> someone in Singapore started their hour long roll. So I don't know what the heck time it was there, like 9 a.m. or whatever, but he started his roll right at midnight east. Um, so that was cool and, and I was in there commenting. So we had all these people Instagram living their hour long rolls. I, we did it on the Tap Cancer Out account. And uh, you know, at one point I'm on Instagram and just across the top where you see all the circles of stories, it was just all Instagram live people doing their global grappling day roll. I would just swipe and it was like more and more people Instagram. So I'm trying to go into each of them and comment and say, thank you. And, but it was like really cool and, and just totally unexpected. So it's something that we'll have forever now. It's not just something we did in 2020 and then, you know, whatever we'll have global global grappling day sort of on that same weekend at awesome. the end of the year forever. So if you can't make a tournament, that's okay. You just take part in global grappling day or you do both or whatever. So um, that's definitely a silver lining from this year. And it allows the, us to overcome that tournament hurdle. Cause I get it too. Competing is really hard. I get super emotional when I compete and I'm super average. So I lose a lot and that sucks. Um, so, you know, I, I feel awful before a tournament, like horrible butterflies. I'm jealous of the people walking out cause they're done win or lose. They're done. It was just totally different from any other sport where I'd like wake up and like bet a baseball game. Like I'd be so excited or a volleyball game, or whatever, but I don't know. Jiu-Jitsu, it's totally different. So I get when people say, I, I just don't want to compete yeah. or they volunteer or whatever, but, um, yeah, I'm glad that we can get them involved and it, it breaks the barriers so you can do it from anywhere in the entire world. So. That's cool. Yeah, something that I really like about that, never mind the fact that you're raising hundreds of thousands of dollars for for cancer, like which is obviously in and of itself great, but you're you're bringing the community together, right? Like mm -hmm. even without that aspect, you're doing you're kind of giving this gift to to the BJJ community worldwide, um, which I appreciate. Um, but I was looking at it looks like 2021 is a completely full schedule for you guys. Looking, looking yeah. up and down your website. Yeah, we're basically rinsing and repeating the schedule we had in 2020 in, in a lot of the cities that we were going to hit for the first time, and then we didn't, obviously. Uh, we did have our San Diego and Phoenix tournaments because they were at the end of January, beginning of February last year, before we sort of realized uh, the impact that all this was having. Um, so we won't actually be going there this year just because we it's not a good time to go there right now. So And we pushed our typical Connecticut tournament uh, to June. So we won't be starting any tournaments till May. So that gives us, that puts us on basically a 15 month high tournament hiatus from the last time we hosted an event in Phoenix of early February last year, um, to, or it was San Diego, um, to May 1st when we'll have a tournament in Charlotte. So, you know, this, this, uh, this has been difficult for lots of businesses. This has been difficult for jujitsu gyms. Of course, a lot of them have shut down uh tournament organizations were all hit hard for obvious reasons um you know but for us it was really important that we don't sort of come back until we felt like we could do it safely we did host some showcases um because we could have a lot of control over that we hosted them in private jujitsu schools um and 
it just we didn't have to roll out our own mats it was a small space that we could you know nobody else had to be inside of it and uh, we just had sort of a rotating door so you were outside until you were ready to until you were two fights away you'd come inside warm up fight and leave uh the only people who would stay inside were basically our staff which was about eight people um and so we could do that safely and we streamed it for free so people could still watch, you know, their friends compete and stuff, but uh, they were all doing it safely. Everybody masked at all times, competitors and things like that. But we had to figure out how we'd actually roll all that out for a tournament um, and what that looks like. So we have all of our COVID protocols on our website. It's sent in an email to all the competitors um, as well. We're going to do a little social media behind it because I don't really hear a lot of tournaments sort of talking about what they're doing to keep competitors safe. Um, and I, um, obviously there's an inherent risk of doing it now, regardless. Um, so any tournament, including us, uh, that hosts a tournament is accepting a certain amount of risk. Um, but there are things that you can do to mitigate some of that risk. And, right. and I urge all the tournaments to do that. Um, but we're going to do that and it's still going to be fun uh, and we're still going to create impact. But, you know, we wanted to we couldn't be one of the first tournaments to come back, you know, just escaping to Georgia or Texas or Florida or something to find a loophole, somebody that'll let us host a tournament. You know, we're a health-based nonprofit organization. We can't, we can't be put in that light, nor would we want to ever do that um, regardless. So uh, it's taken a lot of sort of figuring out. We were blessed to be able to do the showcases. We had um, four out of the five were hosted at jiu-jitsu schools that just opened them up for free for well closed down their school so we could host our event gave it to us for free um they were super nice um you know letting all of these strangers come in and compete dirt now um is you know not every school owner would want you to do that right so, uh you know and we would hire cleaning staffs to come in the next day and like deep clean the whole thing so um so we were very fortunate between the showcases and global grappling day um, to even just stay in business um, and to keep our employees employed, including myself and my wife, you know, it's my family uh, and Dave. So um, we're set up for 2020 even better with, you know, to do it, to do those tournaments as safely as possible um, and to also have Global Grappling Day to also, you know, be flexible with our showcases. So some might be, you know, on stage, possibly with spectators, possibly not. Some might still be that small, you know, more intimate experience streamed. Um, so, you know, we can be flexible with all that and figure out the best way to do it as we sort of progress through the year and, and are you know, sort of aware of um, what's going on, you know, with the pandemic and where we're at in terms of how much we have to turn up, you know, those, those protocols. And we'll keep a lot of them in place even beyond, you know, when most people think we should. Um, because it's just not hurting anybody. Uh, so, uh, so we'll keep doing that, but I'm excited for, for 2021. Obviously we miss hosting the tournaments and, um, you know, we want to get back at it. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at. Well, I'm glad I'm, it's, it's really good to hear that you were able to take, you know, obviously, like you said, it affected so many people and you were able to take it on the chin and, you know, <laughs> turn it into a good year with global grappling day, right? You made the best of it. And now looking into 2021, you know, we can all hope that, you know, with the vaccine coming out and, you know, like you said, going with, with the protocols and making sure everybody's safe, that you can have a really good uh, 2021, right? You have a full schedule, you know, when you do get going, um, going to some new cities this year? Yes. Um, so I won't be able to remember all of them off the top of my head, but um, so we, in Florida, we will have our second and third cities so miami and jacksonville we'll be going to uh dallas who has been a, a city that people want us to come to for a long time it was actually supposed to be the first texas city we were going to but we had like venue issues so we just pivoted to austin and then austin was great to us austin's a great city to visit it regardless. Is a great city. So that was not hard <laughs> uh so yeah dallas um minneapolis uh, Colorado for the first time, Colorado Springs specifically. So yeah, we've got a lot of um, uh, Kansas City also. So a lot of places that we're really um, excited to go. So it will still be the first time, um, like the most tournaments we've ever had in a year was 13, two years ago. So, you know, we planned for, I think, 24 or 23 or something like that in 2020 plus the five showcases. So it was going to be a stacked year. Um, 
So it'll basically be the same thing minus San Diego um, and Phoenix. So we're at 19 tournaments and five showcases. So um, it's a lot. It's one of the reasons I moved down to South Carolina so I could be 10, 15 minutes from the airport. You know, like I basically travel half the weekends of the year now if there's 52 weekends and, you know, uh, about 26 events. Um, plus all the, the, I go to a lot of cities ahead of time to visit schools and train and sort of tell them about tap cancer out, um, you know, as successful as we are, most people don't know who we are. <laughs> you know, I still can walk into a school and tell them about tap cancer out and nobody has any idea what I'm talking about. So, uh, I still do a lot of that. So the travel of, you know, driving to JFK, which is basically two hours door to gate, um, yeah. it was rough on us and um so we made a, a game move connecticut to the charlotte area but we're uh, we're in a better place now for us to run tap cancer out in general a lot closer to all the cities you know raleigh charlotte nashville atlanta jacksonville all really close to where we are now um so we're, we're in a, a better place so the 2020 was both a, a <laughs> certainly a curse but a blessing as well in a lot of different ways so we just try to look at it that way and uh, and we're we're very much getting ready for 2020. Um, you know, launching registration opens January 15th um, for all of our dates. So we're racing to be ready for for that date. Having all the emails ready, having all the ads ready, getting the posters printed, all that sort of stuff. So I, I, I'm curious, um, real quick. You know, talking about traveling all over the country, mm -hmm. doing jujitsu tournaments, and, and visiting schools. What are like in your experience or some hot spots in the country or maybe surprising hot spots for jujitsu. So I'm going to flip that. Okay. Um, and, you know, so obviously we look at like big cities um, and some of the, the flags that we look for, like has the IBJJF been there? That it's usually a good sign that like there's a good jujitsu, you know, just big, big city and a lot of jujitsu schools in general. So you would think that's how it would go. Um, and Atlanta was a, I mean, Atlanta has one of the biggest sort of IBJJF tournaments. That's not the pans or, or worlds or anything sort of just a city tournament. Atlanta is, is, is it, um, our Atlanta tournament was our worst performing tournament ever. Wow. Uh, and, and I was stunned. I was <laughs> stunned. And meanwhile, Cincinnati actually started off really slow. I thought that was going to be an awful tournament. And then it like took off uh in the same like baltimore broke all sorts of records you know dc i guess has an ibjjf tournament but philly was another perfect example like philly has never had an ibjjf tournament um you know they're sort of stuck between the new york and, and dc so they don't get their own ibjjf tournament that was one of our fastest growing cities ever so I've learned that I don't know anything about picking these cities. So we just try to, so now we just really think about like what route makes sense if we're driving it around the country. Um, yes. Like what, what cities have other tournament organizers gone to? Um, God, there's one, there's a city that I'm like forgetting um, that really surprised us, but yeah, it's usually like the cities that we think will be amazing aren't as amazing as we think. And then the cities we, it's just like a quick stop. They blow, they, they blow all expectations sort of out of the water. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just about, yeah, just trying to, tr to hit as many different cities and States as we can. And it's really, you know, our, our vision, um, is to give every grapp grappler, uh, in the world the opportunity, um, to fight cancer and, and to make an impact. And in order to do that, we have to keep, you know, expanding our tournaments, global grappling days, another way that, that we did that. But, you know, we just want to reach more people. A lot of people, you know, ask because, for example, our Connecticut and our Massachusetts tournaments are both $300,000 tournaments. Like, why not just host two, in, you know, two Massachusetts and two Connecticut's for two reasons. Number one, the second one's never going to be as good as the first one. If you fundraise $5,000 for me, the first tournament. Right. Three months later, you're probably just going to pay eighty five dollars, and you'll you'll compete again. Sure, like we'll still get the, we'll still draw big numbers, but we're not going to get as many people fundraising because you only do that once a year, um, which makes total sense. So I'd rather go to a new city where I have a new crop of fundraisers who haven't fundraised for me for for Tap Cancer Out uh, this year, and also because I just I want to give more people the opportunity to take part in our events. So. 
we'll never return to a city. Like we'll only hit a city once a year. I want tap cancer out to be a thing that people look forward to every year. Like, and we try to return to cities, like if not around the same time, like the exact same weekend. So the weekend before Thanksgiving is always the tap cancer throughout Massachusetts tournament. People like are ready for that. If any other tournament were to try to drop in, you know, they would have a bad time um, because that's the weekend that people sort of plan for tap cancer out. And so we want it to be a yearly event for everybody. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to, to reach as many people as we can. And it's really hard to predict which cities are going to be great and, and which aren't. So, um, yeah, that's the nature of jujitsu. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I and I think, like you said, at least for Radius, right? Not everyone is a competitor there, but there's one tournament every year that we strive to get everyone going out to. It is a Tap Cancer Out tournament. Um, last question I have for you, and uh, this is interesting to me because I I personally like the you know the sub only game better. Uh, I, what was it? Was it two years ago that you debuted the sub only showcase in Connecticut? Right. Yep. Um, yes. Is that, yeah, so I, I don't want to cut you, know, you off. I, I, no, 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 no. I do. Have, I do have a follow up question. I'm just trying to think back in my head. I was actually on yeah. that card, but, yes. um, so you, you had done just traditional, mm-hmm. you know, uh, gi jujitsu tournaments, you know, throughout now, did you switch and add the sum only in just to keep up with the jujitsu meta? Or is that something that you had been like thinking of adding, you know, for a while now? We hadn't been thinking of adding it. But what consistently came up, so it was two things. Number one, there is the black belt conundrum where, you know, black belts sort of expect to compete for free. A lot of tournaments allow them to compete for free. We allowed them to compete for free. Um, But they would create absolute chaos at our tournaments because 30 black belts would sign up and six would show up. And so now our bracket, you know, we don't even bracket ahead of time because uh, it's not even worth it because there's so many no shows and miss weights and whatever. And I can't act like the IBJJF and just disqualify someone because again, what if somebody raised $5,000 for me and they're a pound over or two pounds over, am I going to disqualify them? No, I'm going to bump them up a weight class or whatever, you know, like, so uh, we can't do our brackets ahead of time. So I, I wasn't sure what to do with the black belts and, and I can attest to this, the higher in the belt I got, the less matches I wanted to be fighting in a tournament. You know, I did sure. not want to see another 30 men. It was when I was a blue belt and I didn't know up from down 30 men in a division, whatever, who cares? You know, I'm going to fight in 10 billion more tournaments. Uh, it doesn't matter. But now it's like, I do not want to see that many. That's for damn sure. Like six, that sounds about right. Four, six, eight, whatever. So uh, it was just harder. You know, p- black belts just generally don't like the amateur tournament format, you know, not knowing how many people they're going to fight. Um, and so a number of black belts ha- would reach out and, and I hear a lot where they'd say, hey, you know, if you want like a super fight, I'll do it. Um, and I appreciate that. But, you know, as our tournaments got bigger and bigger, it's really hard for me to just like host a super fight, you know, in the way that uh, Grappler's Quest used to do with like really big name people where they would stop the tournament and yep. like in the middle of divisions, yep. like I'm about to be called <laughs> and then, hey, it's, it's uh, Pablo Popovich and Lucas Lepre and they're going to yeah. fight right now. And then everything stops. But it was cool because these people were like, you never got to see them fight anymore. Um, So I couldn't, you know, I have tournaments with like 800 people. I can't just stop the tournament for you or anyone. And it doesn't matter, even if Keenan wanted to do that. It was like, "Ah, I don't know. Uh, We actually did it twice in in Philly um, for a school owner there. And and his school came out, his his whole affiliation, um, Jared Weiner from BJJ United, they they came out in droves. So um, it was more of like a thank you. But I couldn't keep doing it. I could. Right. It was hard to find him an opponent, number one. Um, and it's just like not everybody really wanted to watch that. It was more like I was doing it as a thank you for all of their support versus like what people wanted to be watching during the day. And I'm very specific about our schedules, and I have to stay on time, and I can't just stop everything for this one fight. So I wanted, instead of saying thanks but no thanks, which I had done a number of times, I said – like, how about you stop being an ass and let's think about like, what can I do 
to give some of these black belts matches without just telling them to sign up for our, you know, tournament itself. Um, Cause chances are, I'm not going to have anybody in their division anyways. And they're going to have to fight up or fight down or like, whatever. It's, it's not fun. Um, so Dave and I just started throwing around ideas of hosting, you know, more of like a super fight type event and, and, you know, fight to win had come to Danbury and I'd fought on that card. Um, and Dave had fought on that card. Um, and so we had that experience and that was that really for all, you know, fight to win for all their faults and all of the great things that they do uh, on both sides, we had an amazing experience and one that was totally different from any other tournament experience. You know, when I go to a tournament, it didn't matter what belt I was, what division I was in, nobody cared. Like I would win, (laughs) my hand would get raised and no one clapped. (laughs) Like no one's there for me. I I don't ever want wife coming to watch me compete. It's so boring for her. Like I never wanted her to do that. And, and, you know, my son was born just, uh, well, I guess five years after I started jujitsu, but it was just not fun. Okay. Not fun for her. So, uh, I usually didn't have a lot of people there and I would go far to compete because I wanted to compete. So, um, versus competing on fight to win. So it's streamed live. So my friends are all jacking my flow grappling subscription so they could watch it. <laughs> Um, and then all my teammates, because their schools in Danbury, they're there, you know, watching my wife came and I can say, Hey, just come at six 30. I fight at seven and we'll be at dinner by seven 30. Okay. That's more palatable for her. So she came, luckily I won. So, you know, hindsight's 2020, it, it's, <laughs> it's a much better experience because I won, but, um, you know, it was great. Like entrance music and like announcing my name and people are cheering for me it's just like not what you get at a typical jiu-jitsu tournament and i'm a nobody and dave's a nobody and 90 percent of the people on that card were nobodies but that's the thing about jiu-jitsu you don't have to be a somebody because you're a somebody to your wife to your buddy who doesn't know anything about jiu-jitsu you know to to like to these people they just want to like see you do your thing they don't even understand what's going on on the mat. And, you know, your teammates are jacked up because they're your teammates. Um, so, like, you don't – it's not – these super fights, like, when Meta Morris was doing it in, in early on, it was just about, like, what big names could we get on the card. Right. And, of course, they got in trouble because you have to pay big names big money because that's why they're big names. So um, – and then you have to get people to watch. You have to get people to buy tickets. And, and so what Fight to Win did brilliantly was, you know, they would have a headliner or whatever, but – you know, it was more so like, let's just get local people who want to sell 10 tickets to their friends and family. And if all, if these 60 fighters sell 10 tickets each, that's 600 people in that place. And that's a lot. Uh, so, you know, we said, how can we apply this model to tap cancer out? And we can't just immediately put people on stage and lights and whatever. So yeah, two years ago, we piloted it at tap cancer out. So it was just black belts. Um, and you know, we didn't have a stage or anything, but we did buy like new mats that were just for the showcase itself. And, uh, we had, it was, it worked out really well because that venue had tons of space for us. So we literally did it next to the tournament. It's the the tournament mats are over here. Yeah. And then, and they also had bleachers that like moved around. So we were able to pull the bleachers right up to the edge of the mat and we had chairs on either side. And so it was like perfect. It worked out perfectly and it was great. And, you know, we had probably like 15 or 16 fights or whatever. Um, and it was really cool. And we said we could do this. So by the next turn, the next showcase we had, it was in Chicago. We did have the stage. We did have the lights. We did, you know, had the entrance music. We had all that sort of pomp and circumstance. We were selling tickets for that. We had VIP tables. So we, we ramped it up pretty quickly. And all of them were really successful. Um, and, it, and it allowed us to get the Nogi people back into our tournaments. Absolutely. You know, people, so we, we originally had Gi and Nogi just like every other tournament we ever did because that's all I knew about tournaments. But then I realized Nogi is more of a drain. Adding Nogi is more of a drain than it is a benefit because everyone's dropping out. They do their Gi division and then they realize they're super tired, or super old or whatever, <laughs> super injured. And they're like, I don't want to do Nogi. So we'd have a division of 16 fall to a division of three. And now we're, we're scrambling to put people together. And, you know, they're not – it's not – two people fundraising it's one fundraiser doing two different divisions so it's double the work without any return for us so it was better number one we added kids and then number two i made it just gi because once we added kids our days were getting so long 
as soon as we had a kids, I had already gotten rid of no gi. So um, it was just gi. Now, if you tell me there's more no gi people who want to do a tournament than gi people, we will immediately become a gi or a, a no gi tournament. Like, right. I don't care about gi or no gi. It's just gi draws more people. So that's why I do it. Um, but I want, you know, there's a lot of no gi people, especially people who are getting huge followings and, and on EBI and, and stuff. And, uh, wanting to take part and I wanted them to take part. And so that's how the showcase was born and we love it. And it saved us this year for sure. And, um, and so for us, it's even less about getting the big names and more about getting the people who want to make a big impact. Right. Like I literally don't care what happens on the mat. If you get submitted in two seconds, but you raise $10,000, welcome back to our next card. You know, like right, right. I, you know, a, a young man had a uh, young man. Oh my God. I'll never say that again. Okay. Not that old to say young man, but uh, a guy um, had, you know, texted me about wanting to get in another card and we didn't add him because we, we have so many more, especially this year where there was no way for people to compete. A lot of people wanted to be on our showcase cards. Um, and so I didn't have room for him. Um, and you know, he was like, man, but you know, I thought with, you know, I, I got my submission really fast and I thought I performed really well. And I was like, bro, I have no recollection of your match. I don't know if you won or lost. I don't know if anyone won or lost. I know nothing. Like, I really don't care about what happens in the mats. I just want people to number one, have fun. Number two, fundraise and, and right. make an impact. And, you know, I want the event to go off safely and, on time and that's it you know i don't really think people care like about how you know if my wife doesn't care about how good my jujitsu is out there on the mat they just want me to have fun hopefully i win but if i don't whatever and and then we move on so um so yeah the showcases have been fantastic and we want to continue to add them to more cities well man you got me sold i definitely i'm out in kansas city and i'm definitely going to do the the regular tournament when you come through and hopefully get on one of these sub only showcases and i'm very happy to hear that you don't care if i do poorly because oh. <laughs> i might do poorly yeah. that's perfect yeah I'm excited to come to kansas city we had actually um we went to st louis um and it did okay but uh we sort of instead of trying to go back there we wanted to go to kansas city because i know they get a lot of tournaments through there as well and um, we actually have a really good venue too. So we're excited about getting out there. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome, man. John, again, we really appreciate you doing this. Uh, just tell listeners everywhere they could find you, social media, website, everything you got going on. Let us know. We're most active on Instagram. So just tap cancer out, uh, find us there on Instagram. Um, the website's tapcancerout.org. Um, there's a lot of information there. Um, you, it, so we're super transparent about everything that we do here. All of our financials is there are there. You can track every dollar where it's ever gone. Um, and uh, an impact page that talks not only about the, the gifts that we're giving to our beneficiaries, but also what we do for the jiu-jitsu community. One of the biggest sort of stories that I'd like to, to get out there this year is that we're our value to the world is not just in the gifts that we're giving um, to our beneficiaries. Obviously, that's really important, and it's funding research and training and, and all sorts of stuff. But, um, you know, just giving people an outlet to make an impact, number one, but to, to honor, to mourn, um, to celebrate the lives uh, of those they've lost. Like, the stories, it was sort of a side effect that I, I didn't really expect where you know people would just come up to me and start telling me their story and like i had um a, a guy come up to me he's probably in his mid-30s he came up to me at our last massachusetts tournament um and he was from philly and i could tell because of his school um and and i remember seeing that school on the the roster you know sort of the brackets and, and being surprised that the, he made it all the way up because we have a philly tournament and uh and he came up with his sister and he's like hey you know, I'm, I'm so-and-so, this is my sister. We, um, we lost both of our parents to cancer this year. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to come to the Philly tournament, but I couldn't, but I told myself, I'm going to make one of your tournaments this year. So, you know, we flew up here to, to, to Boston to compete. And, and this really means a lot to me. You know, jujitsu was the only thing that really helped me get back to normal after my parents, um, both passed away. And, you know, it's just, it's, crazy you know what the stories that i hear and uh a man who lost his wife 
shortly after they got married, which was a terrible story, but he won his first ever gold and he just like broke down on the mats and just laid on the mat and cried. And all of his friends and family like ran out on the mat. And it's like, it's not, it's, uh, it's not about the medals and everything, but um, it's, it's really meaningful that they can do something about it because that's the biggest thing. Like when I looked at my nephew, Michael, I felt helpless. And now these people can, you know, of the jiu-jitsu community can feel helpful. Um, right. And that's really important. So, you know, uh, the dollars that we're giving to our beneficiaries are important, but the dollars we're spending on hosting these events are really important too to, to the community and, and our service in and of themselves as well. So you can get that whole story at the website too. So yeah, just tap cancer out anywhere. Um, shoot us a note and we'll always write back. Appreciate it again, John. Thanks for joining us. Talk to you soon. Can you step to this? Face the pain, no escape. Can you step to this? Face the pain. Face the pain, no escape. Can you step to this? Face the pain, no escape. Can you step to this? Face the pain.